so excited for her to be here. Uh, she was uh, born and raised in Fairbanks, so that's always really fun. And uh, she got her degree from the Pacific Northwest University College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, and you've probably all read her little bio, but it's so nice to see somebody who's um, one of our own. So it's wonderful. Um, and she works over at, what do you call the clinic? Just the OMM clinic or? Yeah, TVC OMM. Yeah, easiest way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they do a lot of great work in um, different modalities over there right now, right? I know yeah. you have like the FDM and some other things going on, but yeah, um, really excited. And uh, with that, I'll go ahead and let Dr. Rebar either get going or do some more introductions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here. I appreciate you guys willing to listen to what I have to say. Hopefully it's of interest. <laughs> uh, let me get my screen shared for you all. All right. So that bigger. Okay. So today we're going to talk about how exercise and movement can help manage your diabetes. Um, there are, I'll talk a little bit about myself. I know that um, you guys potentially saw my bio and Desiree. Thank you for that um, great intro. I'm born and raised here in Fairbanks. Um, did K through 12 at the Catholic schools over at ICS in Monroe and um, was thrilled to be able to come back. So it was always my dream to come back to Fairbanks. I love it. I grew up hearing stories about my grandfather practicing medicine here and that's what drew, drove me to uh, join the medical field. Um, I work at the TVC Osteopathic Manipulative Medicine Clinic. We'll talk a little bit more about what that is. Um, uh, it's not what I went to medical school to be originally. I thought I was going to be an OBGYN, but I am very grateful I found this specialty because it's very rewarding and fulfilling and gives me opportunities like this. So today our goals are going to be to discuss the importance of exercise in managing diabetes. We're gonna talk a little bit about what I do and how potentially integrating uh, our clinic or other clinics that utilize osteopathic manipulation can potentially help in achieving the goals to increase activity. And then strategies that uh, you guys can potentially utilize to safely increase your activity and move your body. So first, how does exercise influence diabetes? There have been many studies on uh, on activity and exercise and how it specifically affects diabetes. One of the biggest things that is shown time and again is that it does help improve glucose control. It can tr helps that in a short term within eight to 10 hours and up to 22 hours after exercise, your blood sugars are more well regulated. This is because the utilization of your muscles will help cells in your body become more sensitive to insulin. Therefore, you can um, take up that glucose and, um, and utilize it instead of it just being in your body and wreaking havoc. So in turn with that, over time, it'll help reduce our hemoglobin A1C, which is, as many of you know, the, one of the targets for uh, knowing how well or under control our diabetes is. Um, uh, exercise increases oxygen consumption in our body and ourselves, which also helps the feedback loop for that process of improving glucose control. So like I was saying previously, the muscle cells contract during exercise, no matter what type of exercise it is, any kind of movement, the glucose can enter the cell with out the need for insulin. So there's secondary pathways. You know, insulin is something that we, um, are, that many people with diabetes are very familiar with um, in helping our bodies uh, um, utilize glucose more effectively, but exercise can help us rely less on insulin or um, other um, medications that help in the insulin um, utilization. Uh, there's other molecular pathways in the body that are triggered with exercise that can decrease inflammatory markers in our body and in the inflammatory pathways, because those also have a feedback loop that can trigger our body to um, have more glucose, too much glucose available in our blood. The increased blood flow in the muscles that's triggered by exercise also um, increases glucose and the cellular uptake of that glucose. 
other ways that exercise can influence diabetes and sort of secondarily ways is it uh, helps improve blood pressure and improves cholesterol. The exercise will lower the risk of heart disease and lowers the risk of nerve damage. So the fact that a, a, a common um, uh, issue that many diabetics will potentially have or do already have is nerve damage in the form of diabetic polyneuropathy. So if you already have neuropathy, exercise can help slow down that process. Um, or if you do not have neuropathy, it can help decrease the chance that you will develop neuropathy if you are exercising and moving. Other additional benefits of exercise in relation to diabetes and in just our overall wealth, uh, uh, wellness is promoting weight loss, um, always including that with dietary changes. Of course, exercise in and of itself will not necessarily um, cause weight loss. Improving sleep, which is ideal, I think, for all of us. Um, anybody who's having an issue with sleep, exercise will actually help with uh, improving our quality <laughs> and quantity of sleep. Um, and might feel happier. So exercise helps your body release endorphins and that um, can help us overall just feel happier, happier about ourselves, happier that we're doing things to make ourselves feel better and help, um, uh, help our health improve as well, which again, feedback to help us feel happier. So a question that happens a lot when I talk to people about exercise is hypoglycemia, right? We don't want to create hypoglycemia. It's more likely to happen with exercise in type 1 diabetics. So just making sure that you are monitoring um, your sugars, um, especially when you're introducing activity. If, you, if, it's, a, if it's new to you, um, exercise related hypoglycemia is actually less likely in type 2 diabetics, especially those that are using insulin or insulin secretagogue medications like sulfonylureas. So to prevent that, you want to start with lower intensity, shorter interval exercises, workouts, so that you can reduce your chances of having a um, hypogly uh, hypoglycemic episode. And again, monitoring your sugars if you tend to be sensitive. Um, have delicate uh, blood sugar changes. There is some evidence of maybe when to exercise. So um, exercise will uh, increase that glucose uptake. So potentially waiting until one hour after you eat can help those um, post prandial or post meal time um, blood sugar spikes. So if you wait an hour, um, there's just some evidence of that it's not a um, solid time, like you always have to schedule exercises an hour after eating, but it's something that if you are worried about your blood, um, your blood sugars, that that's something that you can do for timing. So barriers to exercise for people who have diabetes, neuropathy, that can be a huge barrier. So if you know, neuropathy is going to be that um, desensitization and the effects on the, on the nerves, uh, peripheral nerves, so in your hands and in your feet. And so if you're not able to feel your feet because they're numb or they're tingling or they're burning and there's pain, that can be a barrier. Um, some people that have diabetic neuropathy also have balance issues. So that's something to take into consideration um, when starting an exercise routine. Retinopathy, which is changes in our vision that are, that's associated with diabetes. So that can potentially be a barrier. Um, if you're not seeing well or don't have great peripheral vision, that might change what type of exercises you might be more comfortable um, doing. Coronary artery disease that does um, correlate with diabetes and peripheral arterial disease. Those, if you do have any of those, um, those medical conditions, and as well as neuropathy or retinopathy, it's just important to check with your provider, whoever's helping manage your diabetes and come up with a plan for what's safe, what's gonna be a, um, a good plan for what types of exercises would be best for you. And if you do have coronary artery disease, making sure that you have recent cardiac workup, like an EKG or possibly an echocardiogram to make sure it's safe to pursue exercise. 
So with neuropathy, things to consider, you know, that's one of the things that we can potentially help uh, decrease some of the barriers. So appropriate footwear, having comfortable shoes that um, are not worn out so that you can have good balance. Um, routinely checking your feet yourself or having your provider, somebody else check your feet to make sure there aren't any wounds or other cause for concern um, with uh, your foot health and how that would relate to uh, exercise. And then choosing things like low impact exercises. Running might not be the best idea um, or things like jumping jacks, jump rope, thing that um, uh, kind of calisthenics type of exercises where you're gonna be doing a lot with balance and pounding hard with your feet. So just some considerations. So I'm gonna talk a little about what, what we do at the TVC OMM clinic. So a little bit of history. So the picture here is of Andrew Taylor still. He was the very first osteopath. Um, he was actually an MD and was alive in the 1800s. Back in the times where medicine was doing things like bloodletting, where if somebody was sick, you would um, use either leeches or um, pierce parts of your body so that you would um, drain some blood out to, to bleed out the illness that you would have. Um, things like arsenic to treat people. So that was sort of some of the things, you know, now it's just with our modern medicine, it's just terrifying to think about those things, but that was common medical uh, treatments back in the 1800s. He had six children, I believe, and there was a uh, outbreak that he lost uh, five of his children to an influenza type of virus, um, type of illness. And he did not like, he didn't think that what medicine was doing was appropriate. And so he started studying anatomy more and and understanding some concepts like structure and function in the body actually are related to health. So if something is not moving well in the body, then something, then we might develop illnesses, whether it's just a musculoskeletal illness like pain in our back or headaches, or actually um, systemic diseases like heart disease, um, things like that. So he is the first doctor of osteopathic medicine. He, he developed the first school, which is A.T. Still, named after him, University in Missouri. And um, a fun fact that I like about him was his medical school was the first in the entire country to have a female um, in the classes. So even before any MD schools did, the osteopathic schools were the first ones to integrate females. Um, in the early 1900s, so I th or late 1800s. So I think that's a great um, fun fact about starting to integrate women into medicine way back in the day, kind of before his time. Um, so he, uh, he developed, in addition to the modern medicine for, for then, um, de developed a style of medicine called osteopathic manipulation, where finding restrictions in the body, finding um, parts of the body, whether it's bones, bones and joints, muscles, connective tissue, blood vessels, nerves, basically any of the tissue in the body, figuring out ways to see is that, is that working as optimally as it can from a mechanical standpoint, from a connective tissue standpoint, and developed and taught techniques for how to make the body move better in space, because when the body is moving most optimally in space, there's going to be health. So one of the one of his famous famous quotes for the um, for people who um, study him and study osteopathic medicine is that the doctor is the should seek out health, not seek out disease. So yes, we learn about disease, but we should seek to find health in our patients and health in humans, and and that will help us fix disease essentially. So. A lot of how osteopathic manipulation is used these days is to decrease pain and increase mobility. We definitely have many techniques that can help with things that are um, not necessarily painful, but more systemic illnesses like cardiovascular disease, COPD, asthma, but more often than not, we're known for treating pain. So OMM, 
can help with decreasing muscle and joint pain. Uh, it, we can help things like increase range of motion in the joints. We can help increase blood flow, decrease inflammation throughout the body. And there are techniques that can help with nerve pain. It just depends on the cause of the nerve pain. So I have many people who come to our clinic saying they have neuropathy, but it happens that that pain and discomfort is actually from a different source, not from the nerves. Um, some people that have true nerve damage, that's not always reversible, um, but there are some types of nerve pains that osteopathic manipulation can help with. Um, our clinic at TVC OMM is known, if some of you have been to our clinic or if you've heard rumors about our clinic, um, we definitely kind of have a reputation of being known as sort of a pain clinic, so to speak, because some of our te techniques can be painful. I do want everyone to know that there is a wide range of techniques in that are under the umbrella of osteopathic manipulation. So things that are extremely gentle, such as a craniosacral therapy, which is very gentle, doesn't necessarily feel like we're doing anything to you. We're feeling how the head is moving, how your tailbone is moving, because despite um, many people's beliefs, our heads are not actually completely fused at the, um, um, at the points where our bones come together. Um, there is some little bit of movement and we try to make sure that movement is optimal. Things like muscle energy where we take your body and place it in positions and have you use your muscles to kind of counter force us, um, which can help improve range of motion and, and, and change how muscles firing. Um, high velocity techniques are also uh, common in osteopathic manipulation, thinking of things like going to a chiropractor and having them pop your back or your neck. So we are trained in those techniques as well. Another interesting fun fact on the history of osteopathic manipulation is that um, chiropractors are actually branched off of osteopaths. So um, chiropractors, um, some of the first chiropractors studied under AT still, and then went and started their own school. And that's kind of how chiropractic medicine was born. Um, so those techniques that we do are very similar. Um, we just might implement them in slightly different ways. Um, there's many other techniques. So, you know, I tell people we learn like 30 or 40 different techniques throughout our training. So we can go from very gentle to very aggressive. At the end of the spectrum that's very aggressive that our clinic is known for is a technique called the fascial distortion model. So this model looks at the body in terms of the connective tissue that holds us together in space. And that's called fascia. So for many Alaskans, I like to talk about, you know, many Alaskans are hunters. So thinking of when we skin an animal, there's still that, that silvery layer, that sinew under the skin. Even if you're not a hunter, if you have eaten chicken or cooked with chicken before, you can see that silvery shiny stuff on skinless chicken breasts and that's fascia. And so this model is looking at that connective tissue, which is very important in pain in our body, as well as how our nerves are conducting. Um, and we do things to try to make that fascia move as optimally as possible. Um, some of those techniques can be very painful. We can sometimes leave bruises, um, it, but it's a very effective model and people have pretty good success with um, reaching their goals with that model. But like I said, if that's too aggressive for some people, we have a lot of other techniques to, to try out and utilize as well. And many times we will work in conjunction with the physical therapists, um, massage therapists, acupuncturists in town as well to try to find how we can most optimally work as a team to help our patients reach their goals of either pain improvement or increasing mobility. So if anything that if what's motivating you or, not, or, or preventing you, I guess, um, instead, if something is preventing you from becoming more active because something is painful or you just feel like you don't have great range of motion, that's one reason to come to our office or one of the other offices in town that offers osteopathic manipulation to see if we can help you overcome those barriers to um, start 
start or increase your activity. So strategies for safely increasing activity. <clears throat> So the first thing that I think is the biggest, especially these days, you know, we're on a Zoom call right now. A lot of people spend a lot of time on Zoom. We're not as, um, we don't get to be as social these days as we did a year ago. Um, so we're spending a lot of time sitting um, and especially being the winter in Alaska right now and it's cold and the wind chill. Um, so the, the, a small step that you can take to start becoming more active is just breaking up how long that you're sedentary during the day. So avoiding prolonged times of sitting. Ideally, we should be getting up to move every 20 to 30 minutes throughout the day. Whether that's just standing up and stretching a little bit or going for a walk or doing a lap around our living room. Um, small things like that are huge as opposed to sitting for many hours in the day and even if we're working, whether it's from home or at an, at an, back at an office, um, getting up and setting an alarm on your phone or using an app. There's a lot of apps, you know, people with, the, with smart watches can have those apps that kind of buzz you every so often saying, hey, you've been sitting, you haven't been moving in, um, in a long enough time, so get up and move. And so those are great motivating things and eventually it will become a habit because you, you get used to getting up to move more often than not. So these are, um, these physical activity goals are recommendations based off of research and specifically the research related to diabetes and how much activity is shown to be the most beneficial for diabetics. So 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic, which is getting your heart rate and, um, and respiratory rate high, higher, um, trying to get that per week. So 150 minutes per week um, that can be broken up to 30 minutes a day for uh, five days out of the week. Um, so having it more often is better than less often. Um, including resistance exercises, which we'll talk a little bit more about that, but resistance exercises or strength training, training at least twice per week is, is beneficial um, than um, just sticking with aerobic exercises, which is just getting your heart rate up. Um, setting a goal for yourself and considering involving a team will be um, great motivating factors. So a team being a family member that wants to start getting active with you, a friend with the same similar goals, or um, a multidisciplinary team where you are working with like a physical therapist or your provider or a nutritionist or um, a personal trainer that there are many of in town to try to help you achieve your goals. And it's, it's usually, shown to be more effective if you have somebody else with you working with you to try to achieve your goals with you and that you will be more successful than on your own and again i'll say it again that minimizing the amount of sedentary time so you may not be getting that um, specifically aerobic exercise but you can you're closer to meeting your goals when you're up and moving around more often so we're going to talk about some types of exercise so we're going to talk about aerobic exercise, resistance or, or strength training exercises, interval training, water exercises, and then I'll touch briefly on like yoga, tai chi, those types of things. So aerobic exercise is the is exercises that will get our heart rate up, gets our breathing rate higher, um, and those are things like walking, um, just walking can do that. Swimming, jogging, dancing, you know, even dancing in your living room with your dogs or your grandkids or your kids or by yourself. <laughs> um, that, that can be an aerobic exercise. So aerobic exercise is shown to lower your blood sugar. Again, be sure to start low, go slow, and be careful to not do so much at first right away that you're just tanking your blood, that, tanking your blood sugar. And then aerobic exercise reduces inflammation because of its, um, how it triggers uh, increased blood flow. So what, uh, so sorry, resistance and strength training. So resistance and, or strength training is using weights 
or bands, basically something to give resistance for specific muscle groups. So if you're targeting your arms, things like doing arm curls or things that are um, causing you to utilize your bicep muscles or your tricep muscles or things like squats. Um, you're going to be building and maintaining muscle mass. We, we all lose muscle mass as we age. So resistance and strength training is important to add in addition to aerobic exercise because it helps us specifically maintain our muscle mass. It's not been shown to necessarily be as effective as aerobic exercise to decrease the A1C if we have one against the other, but if we combine them together, they become more powerful over time to um, decrease our hemoglobin A1C. Um, if you've never done any kind of resistance or strength exercises, it's really important to try to get some instruction. Um, In-person instruction is really the best way to do it. You know, there's, there's, you can also use the internet, but having somebody who actually has their eyeballs on you saying, yeah, you're in the right position for that. Cause you, you can injure yourself doing resistance or strength training um, exercises the wrong way. We see it all the time in our clinic, um, uh, even in young healthy people that think they know what they're doing for exercises will come in because they're doing their exercises inappropriately. Um, and then we have to kind of help, help their body unwind the, the, um, the tightness that they caused or the pain that they caused from doing the, um, the exercises inappropriately. It's important to rest between sets. So resistance and strength training can be very fatiguing. So giving yourself opportunities to rest and starting with lighter weights or even body weights and then moving up to more um, high, high intensity, either um, heavier weights or more, um, more restricted bands. So like I said before, different examples of resistance or strength training is gonna be uh, using just your body weight. So you don't have to have anything, um, you don't have to spend money on fancy tools to, or, or toys to exercise with. You can do things like push-ups and lunges and squats and planks. And there's whole worlds of different body weight exercises that you can do um, to hit every muscle group in the body. Uh, I encourage people to sometimes use household items. So using cans of food or um, uh, uh, bottles of like dressing or things like that. For me, when I started working out at home, when the pandemic started, I found a couple bottles of hand sanitizer, which is kind of ironic, I know to say it that way, but I had had a couple bottles of hand sanitizer that were the same. And so I used those for some lightweights for myself. Um, and so weighted exercises where you're holding things like hand weights, um, or up to the point where you doing things like, like bars in the gym that you'll see with people that have um, large amounts of weight um, or resistance bands, which can be very cheap. You can find them in stores and online and they kind of, they basically just resist you while you're trying to do a specific movement, which acts similarly to what a weight would do. Maybe, there we go. All right. Whoop, there we go. Uh, I'm not sure if I, let me know if you hear this. I don't think I pushed my button to listen to, um, to hear, so I might have to stop screen sharing and then pull it back up. So let me know if you can hear this. Resistance training like lifting weights combined with aerobic exercise like running or riding a bike yes. are more effective at controlling type two diabetes, according to a study published in Annals of Internal Medicine. Both kinds of exercise by themselves work. Aerobic exercise was effective for improving glucose control, and resistance exercise was also effective for improving glucose control. What we weren't sure of was whether if you add one to the other, if you do both kinds of exercise, would you get as much of an increased bang for your buck or not? And we found that you did. The effect of doing both kinds of exercise was essentially twice as good as the effect of doing either one of them alone. Dr. Ronald Siegel led the study, which included more than 250 people between the ages of 39 and 70 with type 2 diabetes. We allocated them randomly to four groups, which were aerobic exercise alone, resistance exercise alone, both aerobic and resistance exercise, or a waiting list control where they didn't exercise. Jack Vitalis has battled type 2 diabetes for 27 years. He exercises five times a week, combining aerobic and resistance training. Mondays, I do uh, cardio exercise, which is on the bicycle, the treadmill, and the rowing. 
Tuesdays and Thursdays I do deep water exercise and on Wednesday we do strength, we do the machines like the ones behind us and on Friday it's kind of a free for all thing. This combination of aerobic and weight training has helped Jack lose weight and drop his glycemic levels significantly. My hemoglobin A1C level has dropped from two and a half years ago from 8.5 to about 6.2 which was taken recently. So I think those are tremendous improvements. A 1% difference, in other words, going from 8% to 7% or 9% to 8% uh, is associated with about a 15 to 20% difference in the risk of a heart attack or stroke, a major cardiovascular event. On behalf of the Annals of Internal Medicine, I'm Sonia Martin. So yeah, this, that actually is from a few years ago, and there's even more evidence now about how effective that is. And, you know, I think the one thing that we don't really, and I haven't really mentioned a whole lot of is when you, you know, we all kind of know, um, hopefully, that once you do drop that A1C, you're ho hopefully also less reliant on medications as well, <clears throat> not just um, keeping it down, um, but keeping that, making that lifestyle habit with the exercise, um, in conjunction with decreasing your need for uh, medications to keep your A1C down. All right. Um, so, ah, sorry. So interval exercise. This is one that was, that's been studied a little bit more recently. Um, so interval exercise is exercising literally in intervals. So you alternate high intensity with low intensity um, exercises. So things like doing jumping jacks for 60 seconds and then something slower that doesn't get your heart rate as high for 20 seconds and then a 10 second break is a um, is a type is an example of what that would look like. Um, overall you actually have to ex exercise for less a, a lower period of time. You don't have to go exercise for 30 minutes. You could get a similar effect with only 10 minutes of exercise or 15 minutes of exercise. Another positive that people like about interval exercise is that it adds variety. So you're not just doing uh, five sets of 10 reps of biceps curls. You're doing um, multiple different varieties of a biceps exercise in a, in a more rapid pace. Um, high intensity interval, interval training um, is actually shown in a couple of different large studies to be the most effective interval exercise at decreasing um, uh, blood sugar. So uh, reduce, So one of the studies reduced uh, blood sugar in type 1 diabetes. It has been shown in type 2 as well. A positive uh, as well as the variety is that you don't need special equipment. You can frequently do these just as body weight exercises. Um, and another example that I have here is 30 seconds of a very high intensity exercise, like um, uh, something again, like a jumping jack or jump ropes, things like that. And then 90 seconds of a lower intensity thing, like body weight squats that you're not getting your heart rate up and you're just doing something um, slower. Whoop. Come on. There we go. Both high intensity and low intensity workouts will help you lose weight. But when it comes to improving heart health, new research published in Annals of Internal Medicine finds that a high intensity workout is better. The high intensity group reduced their body weight, they reduced their waist circumference, as the other groups did. But unique to the high intensity group was their ability to manage blood sugar. That was the only group in which we observed benefit. Study participants were randomly assigned to exercise at a low intensity or a high intensity, five times a week with no calorie restrictions. All groups burned similar numbers of total calories per workout and had similar weight loss, but the low intensity group didn't see the same heart health benefits of the high intensity group. Our study results suggest that for managing blood sugar, intensity matters. If you want to improve your body's ability to reduce blood sugar, you want to do the higher intensity exercise. I think that was an important observation of our study. Researchers also found a benefit to cardiorespiratory fitness in the high intensity group. It's well established that cardiorespiratory fitness is an independent predictor of cardiovascular disease and mortality. 
what we saw in our study was that both the amount and the intensity of exercise you performed was associated with benefit. However, the optimal benefit was associated with increasing exercise intensity. The good news was high intensity wasn't too hard. The high intensity workout is high relative to the low intensity. So it was very palatable. It was essentially walking on a treadmill. None of our participants were jogging or running or training as an athlete might do. So it was very palatable, very easy to do. And our participants really enjoyed the activity and they were pleasantly surprised. For more information, go to annals.org. I think that last piece is really important to, um, to take note of is that it doesn't have to be, you know, people think high intensity, they think of elite athletes and like sprints, things like that. High intensity is relative to what your body's needs are. So just that, that um, example of that woman in the video, just walking at a faster pace was high intensity versus a slower pace walk. <clears throat> um, for the combined high intensity interval training, it's recommended three times per week with a warm up and a cool down. You just don't go straight to a higher intensity or a faster walk. You start slow, let your body um, get used to moving and then do the high intensity for a short period of time. And then you have a cool down period. And again, you can get more effect with five minutes of high intensity walking than if you did 15 minutes of just low and in, low intensity walking. Um, many people have reported pain relief during and after the high intensity. So it can look overwhelming and sound overwhelming to go do something high intensity, but there's pain reducers that are being uh, released in our body doing these exercises that actually um, make it so that it's not as painful frequently not as painful to do these exercises, both while you're doing it and for a period of time after you've finished your, um, finished your workout, as long as you did it in a safe way. Um, Long-term supervised exercise um, can, in the studies that were about interval exercises, demonstrated that, um, that these high interval exercise, high intensity exercises delayed the onset of diabetic neuropathy in a few different models. People that had current neuropathy symptoms um, didn't necessarily show a specific change in the neuropathy, but it there is uh, some evidence that it slows down the progression or stops the progression of neuropathy that's already present. Just not necessarily reverses it. Water exercise is fantastic. I really wish we had more options in Fairbanks, but there's a few places um, for options for water exercise. So basically using a pool, using water to modify different exercises. So you can walk in a pool, you can do different things where you are, um, you use like floaties or boards like these um, individuals in this picture here and you can do and you can get your heart rate up you can still um, you can do some weighted things even in the pool and it's safe and it really helps people that have um, that might have mobility problems whether it's due to weight or uh, other barriers like osteoarthritis in your joints um, and I, you know, I tell people that it's kind of like anti-gravity. So being in a pool really just takes that pressure off of, of joints that might have some significant pain and makes it easier to move. Um, uh, I don't believe Mary Sai is open right now, but Hammy Pool is an option, the Alaska Club. Um, and there's one physical therapy place in town that does some pool therapy. So that's an option to do physical therapy um, in a pool um, at, uh, I believe it's hometown physical therapy. So, and you can do, and you, and for the places that are public pools, you can just, you can go work out on your own. They sometimes do have groups, um, or taking specific classes that are, uh, water classes. And then yoga and yoga Tai Chi types of exercises. So, um, these are really helpful for balance and helping you either maintain your balance or regain balance. Um, it can help increase flexibility too, which is also important as, as we age. Um, and there's a variety of options of intensity. Uh, so a lot of people, I think I, in my experience, I feel like there's two ends of the spectrum that people visualize for yoga. 
people think of the type of yoga where you kind of just go and people talk really slow at you and it's calm music and you can basically fall asleep. And that's not really ideal for some people. For some people, that's great. It's very relaxing. You can do lots of long, slow stretching and it's the perfect um, safe space to develop that flexibility and balance. For some people, they don't have the attention span for that kind of yoga, but and there's actually a lot more higher intensity yoga classes that might be more of a fit for people that just need that um, stimulation, that attention span. Um, there's also options for things like chair yoga. If, if the thought of yoga and you're thinking of people going and putting their legs behind their heads and weird stuff like that, and that's putting you off, there's definitely even milder options. Um, I, I know the senior center at one point in time was doing, um, chair yoga um, classes. I, I did not get a chance to kind of follow up and see if that's happened at any point recently. Um, but there are places in town that have those modifications where you don't have to get on the floor even. You can be in a chair and do a lot of safe poses to still help with your flexibility and actually with your balance even though you're in a chair. So not a lot of studies that I could find particularly about um, uh, diabetes in yoga and Tai Chi. So, but I just wanted to throw it in there as another option of ways to just get moving more. So keys to success, ultimately, the biggest thing, the most common thing that I talk to my patients about is start low and go slow. If you generally don't do a lot of activity outside of going to the grocery store or going to work, you don't want to go out and try to start running you know, to go, go run a 5k. So run three miles or so. You want to start low and start with small intervals and set goals that are accomplishable. You know, if you tell yourself, I'm going to go run a mile and then you get out onto the road and you're like, wow, this is no, I'm done. Then you're not going to be successful. You're not going to go try again the next day. Starting things with things like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go walk to the end of my block and back. Okay. That's, uh, or it's the middle of winter, so that might not be realistic, especially a day like today where there's snow everywhere. Um, but or I'm gonna I'm gonna do ten laps around my living room. You know, starting with something like that is 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 achievable for many people. And then you, after you do that for a couple of days, okay, now I'm gonna do twenty laps in my living room the the next day. And then eventually, when the sun comes out and we can go outside again, and there's no ice on the ground we can change that goal to one lap around the block, two laps around the block. Um, using things like a pedometer or an accelerometer or apps. So a lot of, um, like I said before, phones or smartwatches, a lot of people that have those, they're almost inherently in the, in the, um, in the apps on your phone or your, or your watch anyways. But there's other apps that you can utilize. Um, these are just a couple of the many that exist out there. Google Fit, you can do tracking. Um, my Fitness Pal is one that I recommend frequently to my patients um, and is free as of the last time I checked. Um, and uh, Apple, Apple um, products also have, and um, I'm not an Apple person, but I believe this green little man here is the, uh, <laughs> is the icon for that app there. Um, so the nice thing about these apps is you can track your progress and you can be like, wow, I accomplished that this week. Like last week I walked this many steps or this much distance. And now this week I'm going to set my goal a little bit further. And so you can really feel proud of yourself and feel accomplished when you can actually track your progress and what you're doing. Or you can see, wow, last week it took me um, 15 minutes to walk a mile. I'm going to try to do it in 14 minutes this week. Things like that. Um, also, it's important to kind of keep some variety, some spice in your life, right? So breaking up your workouts. So doing things like aerobic exercises. So we talked about starting small things, five minutes a day, um, three times a day, as opposed to doing once for 15 minutes might not, it might not be as easy to find 15 minutes in your day, but maybe you can find five minutes after each of the meals of your day. So cumulative, you got 15 minutes that day or 10 minutes and now you got 30 minutes that day. Um, so you do the same thing with the, sa the same amount of time, the same amount of intensity, but you break it up and make it more manageable throughout the day. Um, 
So that would be for an aerobic <clears throat> type of variety. And for resistance, like I said before, start with a low weight, start with a low resistance and slowly increase um, over time your, uh, the weights or the, um, or the resistance. Um, alternate workouts one day to the next. And something else that uh, if you come to our office, we will push um, incessantly upon our patients is the necessity for hydration. So as a general rule of thumb, very important to drink a lot of water in your life. Um, also, if you're exercising, so it's really important. You're gonna, um, you're more likely to get cramps if you're dehydrated. You're more likely to injure yourself if you're dehydrated. So important to drink water before, during, depending on how long you're working out, and then um, after as well. Um, for my, I have many patients who are avid, you know, coffee drinkers or soda drinkers, and I think that it, you know, starting and just saying cut everything out is not necessarily realistic. Um, cutting out all the caffeinated drinks and trying to just replace with water, starting with just a little bit. So every time you drink a cup of coffee, drink a cup of water, and then the more you do that, you'll realize you probably need less coffee and you can drink more water um, to stay hydrated. Um, other things to think about that are that sh might be pretty easy to integrate into your life of just increasing activity without formal um, exercise. Walking instead of driving, um, again, might be easier in the summertime here, but if you um, live down the street from an activity or from a family member um, or school or work, or whatever, um, might be easier to, uh, uh, or might, you, you would get more activity by leaving your vehicle at home, walk or bike instead if that's safe for you and not in, in within a reasonable distance. Um, another variation on that is park further away in a parking lot, right? So just park at the end instead of fighting somebody for that closer spot near the entrance to Fred Myers. Just park a little ways down and help, and help increase your steps. Um, take the stairs instead of the elevator. Um, that's, that's another great way to um, increase your activity. Just getting out and playing playing with your with your pets, playing with your kids, playing with your grandkids. Um, that's a great way to just get more activity and getting up to play, not just playing, um, playing games or board games or something, getting up and doing activities that are movement related play. Um, work, work and reward. So give yourself rewards for things. Um, so like when I was in medical school, sometimes it was hard to motivate myself to do things like exercise. So telling myself, okay, if I go work out for a half an hour, I can go um, watch a, a episode of my favorite sitcom for, for a half an hour or something, you know? So you can do things like that to reward yourself, like, um, and that might help motivate you as well. And then again, I'll reiterate, teaming up with somebody else that has similar goals as you, and then you don't, you don't have as easily an excuse to say, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. Cause you have someone calling you up saying, Hey, um, we're going to go walk today. Right. Yeah, I guess I wasn't going to, but yes, we're going to go do it together. And that's more motivating. So ultimately take home points. I'm going to sound like a, like a record on repeat, but the, um, high intensity exercise or a combination of aerobic and resistance exercise has shown to be the most effective at uh, glucose control in diabetics and reducing your A1C and other added benefits of improving your heart health in many ways in terms of blood pressure, cholesterol, um, and improving blood flow. Please check with your provider. Um, uh, and it's, it's always good to set yourself up at that baseline too. What's my most recent A1C? What's my goal going to be? Um, and then checking in with them periodically to see, um, uh, see what your successes are and how things are improving. Um, and also just making sure your heart is healthy, your body's healthy and ready for you to increase the exercise. Start low and go slow and pick somebody to, um, to set some goals with. <clears throat> so these are just some sources of the, of the research from, um, that, I, that I utilized for, um, for this presentation. Um, and a nice picture of one of my dogs up on a mountain. So um, I did see in the comments, where did my box go to um, <clears throat> look at the comments, um, that 
uh, betterfive.com has videos with chair exercises and yoga. So you don't even have to go anywhere. I mean, the internet's a great place. Just making sure that, um, uh, that you are, in, uh, that you're safe and you're ready to do these types of exercises, but absolutely can do that at home. Thank you for that resource, um, Annette, for the chair and exercise and chair exercises and yoga. Um, what other questions do you, does anybody have about exercise and how it affects diabetes or the OMM and how that can help. Um, yeah. Hey, Dr. Rewa. So, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> you go ahead, Desiree. I'll go next. Oh, so, I mean, we all know that uh, Desiree utilizes OMM. Um, but one of the things that I always found interesting was um, as a patient and as a nurse is that it's the thing that hurts the most sometimes is not the thing that is actually, um, that needs manipulating or needs work. It's often either like above or below. So it's always trying to remind folks that, you know, the knee might hurt, but it might not be the knee that right. is, you know, damaged or whatever. So Absolutely. Yeah. And that's a, that's a really great point. And I think a lot of people will get fixated that it, it's my knee, my knee or whatever, for example. And I think I, I tell, I tell my patients all the time, I consider myself a mechanic. So I'm looking at your whole body every time you come into the office and yes, I'm going to look at your knee if you're coming in with knee pain, but I'm also going to be looking at the whole body and seeing how everything is moving in unit as one, um, as one moving being and make sure all of you is, is moving it to the best of, um, its ability to, for your pain. Absolutely. Sometimes it is that spot. It's just, that's, that's it. That's where it is. Um, but sometimes it's related to things nearby. So peripheral neuropathy affecting balance. Um, so, Definitely checking with your doctor first to, you know, how, what, for the extent of the peripheral neuropathy and, you know, there, the, the nerve damage itself can, you know, depending on what the neuropathy is from, um, might not be reversible, but that doesn't mean your body's destined to not have that proprioception. There's a lot of, so proprioception is how our body determines whether it's in balance or not. And so um, sometimes seeing a person who does body work like OMM can be helpful. Um, working safely on, on your balance, um, there's, there's, a, there's some, uh, some safe exercises to do to try to increase to the best of your abilities. And you may not ever get your balance back 100%. It's hard, I don't, you know, I don't know the circumstances and that's why talking to your doctor is important. Um, but, but trying to maintain the balance you do have and even improve it is possible. Dr. Rebar, um, I, uh, along the same veins, I was going to ask a question about neuropathy and, um, you had mentioned that, um, exercise, uh, particularly high intensity exercise can reduce the progression of neuropathy, but not necessarily reverse it. Um, what about the OMM treatment? Um, will OMM treatment possibly reverse some of neuropathy or um, reduce the progression? That's a great question. Um, so uh, the answer is, Depends, of course. Uh, that's you know one of my favorite answers, and all, most people's least favorite. So many people with diabetes have neuropathy. It's not always diabetic neuropathy. And so what I tell people is that it's always worth a try to see if our our manipulations can help. Because I have many people who come in and just I have diabetic neuropathy. You know I can't feel that toe, or I have this the sensation that's always been there. And sometimes it's not actually related to the diabetes and there's not actually nerve damage. Sometimes it is in the connective tissue or in how the, the muscles are moving and the things that we do make that move better. And then that sensation does come back. That's not always the case, but what we do is non-invasive and it's safe and even though some of the things might cause pain, it's not harmful to the body. 
So my answer is generally always it's worth a shot. If it helps, awesome. That would be um, the ideal situation for everybody. If it doesn't work, we tried. You know, we tried something that was non-invasive, and um, and now we know now we know that it probably is something more inherent um, with damage of the actual nerves. Um, if what we're doing what we're doing isn't helpful, more likely to be at least that it, that it's that it's nerve damage. So that was a really good question. <laughs> yeah. I actually have another question if there's uh, a wait. Yeah, this one has to do with um, high intensity exercise again. Um, um, and I had heard this before um, that some exercises can actually, because you always think um, exercise makes your blood uh, glucose go down and you have a risk of hypoglycemia. But some exercises, particularly anaerobic exercises like weight training and um, some other kinds of exercises actually can increase glucoses. And, and you know, I, I was like, well, that must have to do with, you know, the steroids that your um, adrenal glands are kicking out when you're really working out hard. Um, but uh, is, is that what it is? <laughs> um, I, I think it's really fascinating that, um, that you can actually um, have your glucose go up, but um, it can also mitigate the possibility of going hypoglycemic later on? Um, that's a really great question. Um, and I don't have a great answer for that one, actually. I mean, my understanding was that it was more having to do with activating um, um, other other pathways like um, like getting having your body go to utilize like fat cells and, and create creating mm -hmm. glucose out of that and so I'm uh, off the top of my head how it's the effect on the adrenal glands is possibly a component as well but I um, I don't have a great answer for that off the top of my head but I can definitely um, get you get get an article or get something for you guys to to send out to the participants um, uh, to answer that for sure um, this week. <laughs> so have you, in your practice, have you noticed um, a, a swing towards more folks utilizing OMM and like physical therapy? Because it seems like we've seen in the hospital OMM being used and things like that for pain relief and um, some neuropathy, you know, and, um, you know, pinching places and stuff like that. Have you seen it just kind of like growing? Just as, a, as um, just in town in general? Yeah. The utilization of it? Um, I think so, absolutely. We're, um, we've been pretty busy um, at, at, our, at our clinic. So I think that that possibly reflects. And I think a lot of it reflects that people are doing well. And then we get a lot of referrals by word of mouth. So people do well with what we do. And then they tell their friends and their coworkers, and then they want to try it out too. Um, many, most people that come in our office can be helped to some extent. Um, we can't help everybody. It's not a magic, um, magic wand that we have or magic hands that we have, even though it feels like that. I wish it would be that way. Um, but uh, a lot of people are willing to try it out because, you know, I think the general uh, population, not just in Fairbanks, is looking for more um, uh, non-pharmacologic, non-medical uh, alternatives for, um, I don't want to call it alternative medicine because it's not alternative medicine. It is, you know, we're, it's part of the medical community, um, but some people think of it as an alternative medicine because it's not a medicine you put in your body <laughs> and it's not an injection and it's not invasive. Um, so I, I think overall nationally, we're seeing more people being interested in this type of treatment and Fairbanks is no exception to that. <laughs> is the, pro the, the vicious cycle begins when you become active, you get injured or you're having pain or you're having something. So then you're less active and it's yeah. kind of like, it's the cycle that builds. So it's, kind of uh, nice to have a way that some somewhere to help with the mobility part. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It is a vicious cycle for a lot of people. And we, you know, we, we want to help our patients meet their goals, whether that's 100% with what we do or integrating other, um, other activities, again, whether it's physical therapy or home, home stretching exercise programs, like 
ultimately, I wish I would be bored in my clinic. That's what I tell people. Like, I wish that I would get everyone better fast so that they can just go out and do all the things they want to do. And I can sit around and twiddle my thumbs. <laughs> um, so our, our goal is to get people back to the activities they love. I just want to uh, sing your praises um, in terms of the o OMM. Um, I had a uh, bike accident about three years ago, longer than that. Um, and so I had neck problems and, and uh, sacrum and um, kind of hit all over the place. But I went to see Dr. Capistrant and I had done physical therapy for a while. And then it, my range of motion was, was still not, you know, not where it needed to be. So I started with Dr. Capistrant and, and um, so in within 15 minutes, you know, he, he offered more and then I just, you know, kept going back and it just kept going further and further. So that was great. Um, and then something that we both, thought about was um, I ended up going to see um, somebody at Woodland Wellness on um, Thai massage. Yeah. And Dr. Campostrant said, well, it's sort of like he does fracking yeah. and yeah. Thai massage does the drilling. Yeah. The, no, drilling and then the fracking. Yeah. yeah. And so combined, it really worked well. Um, and, yeah. then, and then uh, my provider, um, did a lot of bot, you know, the whole body. Um, and I was sore both, you know, both with Dr. Capistran and with, with a Thai massage, um, which is in a good way, you know, it's just really stretching the body a little bit more. So um, I've referred a lot of folks <laughs> to, um, to OMM. Um, it, um, I had to wear exercise clothes because I sweated. <laughs> um, it's not a lot of time, but it's, um, it really makes a difference. Um, and so I, I just encourage people to, to go, um, um, if, you know, after, um, after not, you know, if, if something is not opened up a little, and it's from anything, you know, from your, your hands to your, you know, to any, any part of your body. So um, just really Thank appreciate it. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> I'm glad, yeah. I'm glad he was, we were able to help. That's great. Yeah. 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 So whether it's preventing you from doing something or you start doing something and then you start doing more activity and, and pain starts or you find that something's not moving quite right. Yeah. There's a lot, a lot of very, there's a lot of reasons people um, would come into our office. So that's great. And sometimes I, I would say, well, it's just, it's, it's my, my neck and right. then he will just work on it. So you don't have to know exactly where the pain's coming from because yeah. you guys, you guys figure it out. <laughs> so. That's our job. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> the best of our abilities. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. Dr. Rebar, do you have to have a referral from a primary? Great question. Not for our clinic. No. Um, the, the only exception to that rule is um, TRICARE and VA. Um, they, they do need referrals just because of how that type of insurance works, but um, anybody else can just call our clinic and make an appointment. Yeah. And we actually see, just sort of like as a side note, we see all age groups. So we see everything from a newborn baby within a few hours of life to people um, near the end of their lives. You know, I think the oldest patient that I've seen recently is 97 um, in my office. And actually three of us do go to the hospital. Desiree kind of mentioned that in passing that we go see people in the hospital, whether it's babies that were just born or people after an operation to help with um, post-operative pain or constipation because of anesthesia, things like that. And then we go to like the Denali Center and see people there as well. I know you've seen a lot, some folks just, you know, when they're, when you're sick in the hospital and you're stuck in a bed, yeah. you know, yeah. it, it makes mobility really difficult and you know a lot of things range yeah. of motion gets lost but exactly. that so yeah you know, we've seen a lot of we've seen you guys come in and that's so nice to see that our physicians at the hospital are reaching out into our community yeah. to find those kinds of yeah um modalities i agree dr rebar you mentioned constipation yeah 
It helps with constipation too, huh? It can. Yeah. So there's a lot of, so like I said, a lot of people think of us just for pain and that's, you know, the majority of what we see, but things like abdominal pain, constipation, um, uh, uh, menorrhagia or cramps or pain with, with periods for, um, women that are, um, in that stage of life, things like that. Um, we treat pregnant women too, just on that note, um, headaches, um, sinus problems, asthma, yeah. What about migraines? Migraines, yeah. That, that mm -hmm. struggle with, would they need to be like, just in between migraines? Um, no. I no. have Someone a can, friend. <laughs> yeah. Someone could be active, definitely active. Um, we def we see people, it's, it's, it's sometimes easier to treat if someone's actively in pain um, versus between headaches, but we can still treat them if they're between headaches and migraines. And some people think they have migraines when it's not actually a migraine. Um, that's what they, um, cause migraine is just a common term for headaches, but a lot right. of people don't actually have true migraines, but we still treat people with true migraines. Any more questions, everybody? I appreciate you guys having me. Is there anything in the chat? I gotta look. <laughs> uh, I think we, I think I addressed the only one that I see at least, unless anybody got individual um, questions. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, nope, I see you did, a, you addressed the one that I saw too. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rebar, for doing this. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Happy to happy to do it. You know, it was so it was such an interesting way that I found OMM, even yeah. though I was in the medical, you know, community as a nurse. Um, it was during pregnancy of all things, so mm -hmm. it was kind of like, man, I was so grateful for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I was having difficulty walking and. Man, I was able to get to the end without any problems, thanks to you guys, so. Glad to hear it. <laughs> well, thanks again, and if there aren't any more questions, we'll let everybody get on with their Thursday night. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.